Listener Production. Hi, Sasha Barbagat with you. Welcome to The Briefing. We know housing in Australia is in a pretty big mess and it's going to factor highly on a lot of people's minds when it comes time to vote next year. So what do the parties plan to do for you when it comes to the accessibility and affordability of housing? Over the next three mornings, we speak to the housing spokesperson of each of the major parties to find out. Today, it's the Shadow Minister for Housing, Michael Sukar. Borrowing from your super for the period of time that you need it and then putting it back in, we think is a really important policy and it tips the scales in favour of first home buyers. That's coming up in the second half of this episode. First, though, it's time for the headlines with Chris Spiru. Today's Tuesday, the 24th of September. Good morning, Sash. We start in the Middle East this morning where Israeli strikes on Lebanon have killed at least 356 people and injured 1,200 others. Israel issued an evacuation alert via phone messages in the hours before it launched its strikes, sparking a mass evacuation of thousands of Lebanese citizens from the south. Lebanon's health ministry says 24 children and 42 women are among the dead, with the death toll expected to climb in the next few hours. The country's south and east were hit first yesterday, our time, with additional strikes then hitting the capital early this morning. In a video statement, an IDF spokesperson said the preemptive strikes have hit civilian homes that they believe are being used by Hezbollah to hide and store weapons. For over 20 years... Hezbollah has deployed its arms inside homes and militarized civilian infrastructure. As a result, the Hezbollah terrorist organization has turned southern Lebanon into a battlefield. That was Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari speaking there. And it's worth noting Israel has really turned its attention to focus on Lebanon, even flagging that it's kind of not really worried about Gaza right now and what its operation is. Uh, in Palestinian territory. Israel has called on its citizens in the north to comply with all government directions to seek shelter and avoid public outings as cross-border fighting continues. Chris, this is the deadliest Israeli bombardment on Lebanon since 2006. That's when there was a 34-day conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. The US has also responded. The Pentagon saying it'll send additional troops amid this latest surge in violence. The US hasn't specifically commented on how many soldiers or what that additional troop force will look like, but we know that there are already about 40,000 troops in the region. Back home now, where Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has lashed out at Coles and Woolworths, saying they added to inflation by charging more for products than they were worth. It's off the back of yesterday's huge call by the ACCC, that's the consumer rights watchdog, to sue the supermarkets. So the ACCC is accusing Woolies and Coles of pushing up prices, then dropping them and resetting the costs at almost 30% above the original price and then selling it to consumers as discounted. These are serious allegations that the ACCC is bringing before the courts. If this is found to be true, It's completely unacceptable. This is not the Australian spirit. Customers don't deserve to be treated as fools by the supermarkets. That's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese speaking there yesterday. Yeah, the competition watchdog says Coles and Woolworths breached consumer law by misleading customers and is seeking really big penalties, which could hit as much as $50 million. Coles has responded to the allegations, saying it will defend itself. Woolworths hasn't committed to defending the legal action, but says it will be reviewing the ACCC's claims. I wanted to bring in an example of how this might have worked in practice, because it kind of might sound a little bit confusing when you're just hearing someone say it to you. So the ACCC used this specific example in its legal action. So it said Coles was selling a 16-pack of Strepsils. It was offering the packet for $5.50 for all of 2021 and most of 2022, uh, marked with a red sticker in its down-down category. So the supermarket then increased the price to $7.00 for 28 days, and then the Strepsils pack then went into another down-down promotion at $6 and advertising a was price of $7. But we know that they were selling it in 2021 and 2022 for $5.50. But by spiking the price, bringing it down, they were saying, oh, it's discounted. Essentially, what the ACCC is accusing the supermarkets of doing is completely misleading customers. And as uh, Albo said, if these allegations are found to be true, it is a very, very serious offence. Speaking of numbers, Sash, the Reserve Bank Board is meeting today to make a decision on the official cash rate. And most economists are tipping it'll leave interest rates on hold for the seventh meeting in a row. 
So the question that remains is when we might be seeing a cut. The RBA is keeping things steady, arguing that inflation is still too high, but we have seen inflation continue to slow, so reaching an annual pace of 3.5% in July. Yeah, and we're expected to see August CPI numbers uh, fall within the RBA's 2 to 3% target range when they land tomorrow. Unfortunately, that's coming 21 hours after the RBA's two-day meeting ends, so it won't factor into the RBA's decision today. And on top of all that, the US Federal Reserve made the call last week to lower interest rates, and that was for the first time in four years. So we're seeing this happen overseas as well. I think uh, pressure is kind of mounting on the RBA to to make a call and, and cut the official cash rate. Now, if all of this is kind of, uh, you know, you're like, well, what does any of this matter to me? We have actually done a deep dive on this. It was really helpful in explaining how the cash rate plays into everything else when it comes to your money, my money, the country's money. Uh, it was on June 19, uh, titled, I don't have a mortgage, why should I care about the cash rate? So if you want to go back and have a listen, really worth it. We also did one uh, earlier this month uh, that was explaining the economy, the GDP, the RBA, and what all the economy chatter means for you. So worth having a listen if you want to understand it a little bit bit better. And the AFL's Night of Nights has crowned Carlton's captain Patrick Cripps the 2024 Brownlow medalist. Carlton P. Cripps three votes and I declare the winner of the 2024 Brownlow medal Patrick Cripps of the Carlton Football Club. It's the second Brownlow and Cripps also broke the record for most votes received in a single AFL season in the process with 45, Chris. Ah, yes, a round of applause for Cripps. Good on him. Been tracking him all season long, (laughs) Sasha. But look, I want to talk about the Katy Perry and AFL grand final drama. Oh my God, tell me. So this made headlines yesterday. So according to inside sources and respected journalists in the field, The US pop star had a secret beef with the league over what she'll be performing at the grand final on Saturday at the MCG. So Mm -hmm. apparently the AFL only wanted her to play certified bangers. So those are things that we know and love. You know, I'm thinking hot and cold. I'm thinking firework. But Katie said out of the five, she wanted to play two from her new album. Which has widely been panned and it's been called a flop. Yes, because it had a lead single titled Woman's World, which a lot of people in fact said does not encourage a woman's world. Mm -hmm. Um, So apparently there was a bit of a back and forth, but they did land on an agreement. There will be four songs from the archives that Aussies know and love and one from the new album. Okay. I think that's a fair compromise. I think you want people to play songs... At a, at a five song performance, when it's at a grand final, where it's at the footy, you're talking to footy fans who mm-hmm. may not be the most up to date with Katy Perry's latest singles. They'll know Raw, they'll know Firework, they'll know California Girls. Like, play those songs. That's what people want to hear. You want people to be pumped up at the grand final. Let's forget about the big stars. This was my favourite AFL grand final performance. Now, this happened all the way back in 2004 when uh, Port Adelaide played Brisbane for the premiership. They call me Lady Bob, Lady Bob, it's no lie. Lady Bob, Lady Bob, look at me and you my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I want to describe what we're seeing on the screen here. I've got it playing on YouTube. We've got uh, Kim, these are Kath and Kim, the ladies of Fountain Lake, obviously, mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Kim's got uh, short denim shorts on with her G-string <laughs> hanging out over the top. Kath is in a, like, jumpsuit with tiger patterns on it and she's even got a little tiger tail because she's famously a Richmond Tigers fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is an example of just how great halftime performances can be <laughs> and I think that's what we should aim for every single year. The NRL too, like, come on. Oh, yeah, global superstar Katy Perry. The standard has been set. <laughs> Let's see if she meets it, Sash. <laughs> oh, Chris, thanks so much for joining us for the headlines. Next up, we're getting into the first of our three-part series, talking to the big political parties about what they want to do for you for housing. And today we're speaking to the Coalition spokesperson, Michael Suka. There's a lot of noise out there at the moment when it comes to housing in Australia, but there are some straight facts that we know to be true. When it comes to renting, there are fewer homes available and that's helping drive up costs, while buying is harder than it's ever been with soaring prices and not enough supply. All sides of the political divide like to criticise the plans of the other parties and argue that their way is the only way. 
And that makes it hard to cut through the spin and the noise to get to the real meat of what they're actually planning to do. So over the next three mornings on The Briefing, we'll be bringing you an interview with the housing spokesperson of each major party, Labor, the Coalition and the Greens. We're asking them, without the political point scoring or cheap attacks on their opponents, to break down what their plan is to address Australia's housing problems, from rents to mortgages, social housing to supply and everything in between. Today, I'm joined by the Shadow Housing Minister, Michael Suka. Michael, welcome to The Briefing. First up, what is the Liberal Party's vision for solving the housing crisis in Australia? I'd love for you to give me the Coalition's elevator pitch, how you plan to make housing both more accessible and more affordable for more people in this country? Our pitch to Australians is that we are running an unsustainable migration program at the moment. We've brought in more than a million people over two years. We've built uh, fewer homes than we built for the last decade at about 260,000, which self-evidently means there are a million people who are fighting for every rental, every property in the country, and of course, driving unaffordability. And I always preface these things, Sasha, by saying I'm a product of migration, so I'm a huge supporter of migration, but it's got to be planned. It's got to be something that's in our best interests and more than a million sort of record levels of migration when we're building fewer homes is not the way to go. The second thing we want to do is tilt the scales in favour of first home buyers. That's the reason why we took to the last election our super for housing policy, enabling Australians to access a portion of their super up to 50,000 of superannuation to put towards their deposit uh, and then requiring them to put that back into super when they sell the home. So really investing your own money in your own home, using your money, your super is your money uh, for the time that you need it, but then ensuring that you protect your retirement savings by putting it in at the end. We're unashamedly of the view that the last thing Australia can do is wave the white flag on home ownership. And we think worryingly that it's creeping into the language of political parties, whether it's the Labor Party or the Greens, but I think it's creeping into everyone's language to some extent. An acceptance that the next generation of Australians won't have that realistic aspiration of owning a home if they want one. And that would be the first generation of Australians that we would be asking to accept that situation. And I don't think, well, I know for a fact that the Liberal and National parties believe that we cannot have that as a status quo position. Let's start with migration. Um, What policy specifically is the coalition taking to the election on migration? And is that policy too hyper-focused on people as opposed to the issue of housing itself. And that is, I know it's a, you know, it's a package deal. You talked about first home buyers and we will get to that. But do you think that's focusing on an issue that's kind of outside what the crisis actually needs to be addressed? No, we think it's it's almost at the centre of where the crisis has gone. And you don't really need to be a housing expert to draw the link between migration and housing. Now, we think the most important form of social infrastructure in this country is a roof over people's heads. And so we think it's absolutely acceptable to draw the link between migration levels that we have not seen since post-World War II, to be frank. We are building less homes than we built every year for the last 10 or 15 years. So when you're building fewer homes, you just can't bring in record levels of migration because every one of those people needs a roof over their head themselves. So we never blame the individuals. We don't blame the individual migrants who are applying and coming here because they're following the rules and doing the right thing. We're blaming the government. Mm. What's the actual policy, though? Like, what will you be limiting it to in the short to medium to long term? So we announced in the budget in reply that we would reduce the permanent migration program by 25% and the net overseas migration levels would about halve. So not only are we going to drastically reduce migration based on just what the government forecast, it will even be a bigger cut when you compare it to what is actually happening because all of their forecasts are getting blown out of the water. They said that they were going to reduce migration and it's not reducing. We're still at 510,000 people for the last year. 
There are all sorts of questions and arguments around reducing migration or keeping it the same or whatever, uh, but specifically in relation to the housing crisis. You know, so many of the migrants that come to Australia are skilled migrants or they're tradies who actually help build those homes. And we know that supply is one of the biggest issues in Australia right now. So are you not concerned about the impact that cutting migration by that high of a level could potentially have on building those future houses? Well, no, because you'd be surprised to hear, and many of your listeners would be surprised to hear, that our migration program is not directed towards the people whose skills we need to build homes. In fact, because of the control that the CFMEU has had over the Labor Party, the the migration program is quite drastically skewed away from that because it's in the CFMEU's interests to essentially ration the skilled workforce, and they have not wanted those sorts of migrants coming to Australia. So not only are we bringing record numbers of people in, we're bringing fewer, as you would describe, skilled uh, individuals who can work in our housing sector. So it's the worst of both worlds, and we're bringing in a lot more yoga instructors than we are um, builders at the moment. Let's move on to your plan for first home buyers. So this is the superannuation scheme to allow people to access a portion of their super would love for you to take us through the specifics of that policy. How much money? When can they access it? Are there any other rules around it uh, so that our listeners can understand exactly how that might work for them? Basically, our policy will apply to first home buyers who want to live in a home. So um, it'll be for people who are using a home, purchasing a home as a principal place of residence. They'll be able to access up to $50,000 from their superannuation to contribute towards the deposit to purchase the home with a couple of conditions. And the conditions will be that when you sell that first home, and on average Australians hold their first home for seven years, that when you sell that, you recontribute the amount you took out plus the proportionate growth uh, in that asset. So I'll give you a really simple example. With numbers that are probably pretty unrealistic for certainly Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, but I've got to keep the maths easy here. Buying a $500,000 home, you pull out 50000 of your super to contribute towards your deposit. You purchase the home, you hold it for seven years, uh, and then you decide to sell and perhaps upgrade to a second home. When you sell that home that you bought for five hundred, it's now worth $800, let us just say, for example. You've got to recontribute the 50 plus the growth, which is in this case 30 because your $50,000 deposit represented 10% of the $500,000 purchase price at the start. So you've got to recontribute at the end 80,000. So you've got the use of that money when you needed it to buy a home, but your super doesn't lose out because at the end you're putting it, not only are you putting in the capital amount, you're putting in the amount that your asset grew. So in a sense, you're investing in your own home for superannuation purposes. Uh, And then at that point, you're done. Your super and your home are very separate. So utilising your savings within super, in a sense, borrowing from your super for the period of time that you need it and then putting it back in, we think is a really important policy. And it tips the scales in favour of first home buyers because investors can't tap into super, second and third home buyers can't tap into super. It's only first home buyers who will be able to tap into their own super to do this. And uh, to get back to my early remarks, wherever we can tilt the scales in favour of first home buyers. That's what we're going to do. And and this is one of those policies. Some of the criticisms from super experts and economists around this policy is the fact that, yes, you know, the policy requires money to be put back in when you sell that house, when you sell that asset. However, 50K out of your super when you're 30 could grow to between five hundred dollars and $600,000 in retirement. And that's thanks to compounding interest. So having that money come out and then, you know, for some 30-year-olds, their super balance might only be 60, 70, 80K. Is there no concern from the party that you're taking that money out and those people are never going to catch back up to that point? Uh, this is where the argument is unfortunately being pushed by vested interests. So the super funds want your money. They They make a living by controlling your money. And to be frank, most of our super funds have very highly paid people, many thousands of people being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to manage your money. Um, So their interest is for you to leave your money in there. That's why they've pushed so hard. If you enter retirement owning your own home, 
you're infinitely better off than if you don't. And the thing about utilizing your super to buy a home is you're leveraging. And the reason why you're leveraging is you're borrowing money to buy a much more expensive asset than you would otherwise. If you look at people's super balances, say from the 90s to today, again, you don't need to be a property expert to realize that if you put your money into Australian property, not only are you going to be in absolute terms better off, but you're going to own a home at the end, which means your retirement income is going to be higher and your retirement outcomes are going to be safer on a whole host of metrics, including not being at the whim of the rental market. So you'll be better off because you'll own a home, but we're also adding the extra protection of recontributing into your super. So your super is still going to be in a really healthy state. Housing, in my view, and I call it the most important social infrastructure, having a secure roof over your head for all those intervening decades is phenomenally important. I think these vested interests in super basically telling young Australians, look, rent for the rest of your lives and we'll look after your money is missing that uh, that important social element we've had in this country of the security that comes with owning your own home. And that's missing from all that analysis. Sure. I do think it's worth pointing out, though, as well, that there are economists, plenty who don't think that this policy is in the best interests of people with a super account. But the other issue I just wanted to quickly touch on before we move on to rentals is... Well, Sasha, can I just say many of those economists are paid a lot of money to proffer an opinion or to do a report. And guess who's got all the money to pay them? Well, it's the super funds who are controlling your and my money and who are getting paid very, very well to do so. And if you look at most analysis, the people we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to manage our money are basically getting returns that any old index fund could get. So they have a real vested interest in making sure that your money and your listeners' money is locked away for them to control. And they're basically saying, look, you've got to accept not owning a house in your life. And that's, I think, where we will ultimately differ because we think that it should be home first and then you look after your retirement, not that... um, you're basically pushed into renting for the rest of your life. And I think no matter how many reports your listeners see paid for by the big super lobby, uh, that you can't get over that very basic logic. I think there are still genuine questions, though, around, you know, we're placing a bet on the housing market that it's going to keep growing it, that there's no question that your investment will continue to earn you money. We know that just like any other, and housing at the end of the day is an investment, And just like any other investment, things can happen. The market crashes, you lose all your money, then you end up in a position where you have less money in super and you're not making a profit on the home that you've bought. So is that not a punt and one that's perhaps too dangerous to take? Let me take you back to the global financial crisis. If the housing market in Australia tanks, then super will tank. I mean, you know, the largest businesses that all of our super funds hold shares in by the ASX are the big four banks. And the big four banks are basically leveraged entirely to the housing market. So just like the global financial crisis in the US, if the housing market absolutely tanked, then the entire economy is tanking, I can assure you, because uh, in a sense, our entire financial system is leveraged off that. You know, Every small business basically starts by borrowing against the family home. So uh, our housing market will basically be a function of the health of the Australian economy. If the Australian economy is broadly healthy, the housing market will be healthy. If the Australian economy is broadly unhealthy, then you'll have some difficulties. In the end, I don't want to see, and the coalition actually doesn't want to see, unrestrained house price growth. What we want to see is uh, certainly no huge revisions or reductions in house prices because that would that would tank the economy. What we want to see is house prices growing at a slightly slower pace than wages. I mean, that's in the end the sort of utopian situation you want to find because what we've seen for the last 20 years is house price growth outstrip wages. That's why I said to you earlier the deposit hurdle is the biggest issue. Well, that's because as a multiple of your income, what it takes now to buy a home has got further out of reach. I do want to quickly ask you if the coalition has a direct plan to help make rentals cheaper. 60 seconds if you've got a pitch that we can quickly squeeze in before the final question. The only way to make rentals cheaper 
in the short term is to reduce the demand for rentals. The only way to reduce the demand for rentals is to get our migration levels at sustainable levels. Uh, I mean, as I said, rents are up by 25% in just two years. It's no accident that that is highly correlated to the fact that we brought in more than a million people in those two years, all, all vying for a rental. And that's what's pushed up rentals. Uh, the only way you fix that is, as I said, align your migration program with the most important social infrastructure that is there, which is housing. Uh, and so um, the absolute best thing that can happen for the rental market is that this record level of pressure being piled onto rentals for migration is reduced. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We've been talking about the housing crisis for a very long time uh, in the grand scheme of things. Can it actually be fixed or should we start adjusting to a new normal? Uh, of course it can be fixed. We can't wave the white flag and just accept this situation. And, and that's what I'm concerned is happening. I, I've, I'm concerned that the young generation of Australians are being conditioned to, in a sense, accept their lot in life and accept the fact that they might never own a home. Now, if if that generation accepts that, then the change that needs to happen won't happen. I mean, our forefathers were able to build new housing developments. Why is it so difficult now? Well, it's because state governments don't want to do it. There seems to have been an adoption of that policy by governments throughout this country that you just keep taxing the hell out of housing. 50% um, of the cost of a new apartment in Sydney is taxes and regulatory charges. It's not the evil developers who wear that cost, it's the end purchaser who is wearing it. And so if you're taxing something at 50%, no wonder it's unaffordable to the end user. And so that tax reform, reducing taxes and planning and zoning reforms, I think are things that, uh, that younger Australians have to demand. And if you do that, we'll get back to building houses for reasonable levels at reasonable prices that the average person can afford. Michael Suka, thanks so much for your time today. We do appreciate you taking through the Coalition's housing policy as we uh, get ever closer to next year's federal election. Thanks so much, Sasha. Appreciate it. Michael Suka, the Shadow Minister for Housing and Homelessness, speaking with me there. And that is it for this episode of The Briefing. Thanks so much for listening. Before you go, we would love it if you could share this ep with someone you think might be interested to hear it. Maybe someone you know who wants to learn more about what the big parties are doing when it comes to the housing crisis. Sharing our eps and following and subscribing us are a huge help and it allows us to keep bringing you more of what we do. So we'd really appreciate it. And of course, we are on socials. Check us out on TikTok and YouTube. Search Listener Newsroom. We're also on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast. And we'll be back in your feed with another ep this afternoon from three. I'm Sasha Barbagat. We'll see you next time. Listener.